Hello. Test. 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 Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and start the commission hearing. It's a busy day here in Washington, uh, but uh, this is important. So good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for this very timely Helsinki Commission hearing on possible political motivation behind Lithuania's request that the United States extradite Judge Naringa Vinsky in a Vinsky in a uh, 2008 Judge Vinsky in a's four year old niece, De Monte revealed to her family that her mother's friends, two of whom were government officials, were sexually, sexually molesting her in her mother's presence and at a local hotel where the mother allowed her to be taken alone with these men. Later investigations showed that the mother had unexplained income and an apartment from one of the government officials named by the girl. Judge Vinskiene and uh, De Monte's uh, father had to plead with the police for a year before they finally began to an investigation. However, the investigation was later ruled to be negligent. Ten members of law enforcement, including the prosecutor general, resigned or were fired over the case. Uh, despite a Vilnius district court ruling that there was enough evidence to indict her, the mother was never indicted for her possible role in the sexual exploitation. Instead, a court ordered Diamante to be returned to her mother while Diamante was the key witness in an ongoing trial against her abusers. The girl refused to leave Judge Vinskine's for fear of further molestation. As you'll see shortly in a video of events, 200 police officers came to Judge Vinskine's house and violently they took the screaming child from her arms, giving her to the mother accused of sex trafficking. The U.S. is poised to extradite Judge Vinskine because an officer was bruised in the scuffle. When Judge Vizcina left Lithuania, the prosecutors were preparing more than 35 other charges against her as well, such as filing uh, petitions with the court on behalf of Diamante, uh, talking with the media about problems in the investigation, conducting her own investigation, desecrating the national anthem, holding rallies, and humiliating the court, even attempting to overthrow the government. Lithuania is a friend and ally of the United States. Lithuania is an exemplary country and regional leader in many ways, but even friends and allies can make mistakes. Even friends and allies can have a weak area in their judicial system. Instead of zealously pursuing the people who sexually exploited Judge Venskiene's niece, the Lithuanian government and judicial system have seemed to have targeted Judge Venskiene. Over the last six years, Lithuania's judiciary has prosecuted for false statements and other alleged crimes the child's grandparents, a medical professional who came forward with evidence, journalists reporting on the case in a way that was critical of the investigation, neighbors, people who attended rallies on behalf of the child, and many others who came forward with evidence or opposed the violent removal of the child from Judge Vinskiene's care. 
I fear that Judge Fenske will not get a fair trial in Lithuania, especially since the chairman of the Supreme Court of Lithuania on national television said that Judge Fenske is an abscess in the political system, and I quote, and another quote, the trouble of the whole state, end quote, effectively prejudicing her case nationwide. Moreover, many of the critical defendants, witnesses, and complainants are dead or have disappeared. The child's father, or Judge Vinskiene's brother, two of the accused child molesters and two key witnesses have all died under mysterious or violent circumstances since the case began. And Lithuania's legal and judiciary committees concluded that the investigation into the child's sexual exploitation was negligent and that the negligence compromised the case against the public officials. It's unclear that the litany of missteps in this child trafficking case can ever be corrected in Lithuania at this point. What is clear is that Judge Vinskiene infuriated many people in power with her anti-corruption crusade and that the charges against her appear to be politically motivated. The U.S. Secretary of State could simply refuse to extradite Judge Vinskiene on the grounds of political motivation, but as uh, yet has not done so. Judge Vinskiene came to the U.S. five years ago seeking political asylum, but her case has still have not been heard. Consequently, Representative Smith and I have introduced pri a private bill, H.R. 6257, on that which uh, would allow Judge Vinskiene to be excluded from the treaty and to finish her case in the U.S. courts for political asylum. We believe that she deserves a chance to make her case in a U.S. court, a chance she has not received thus far. We uh, uh, we also uh, want to make sure uh, that, uh, hang on one second. Okay. Uh, we had invited the government of Lithuania to participate today. The government declined, but did provide written testimony, which we've posted on the website. Here to represent Judge Veskine's case is her son, uh, Kariolis uh, Venkius. Uh, so we will. Uh, move uh, to introduction to him first. Carolus is uh, the son of uh, Judge Fenskiene. He was only eight years old when his niece came forward with her allegations of molestation and watched as the family struggled to seek justice for her. At 12 years old, he fled Lithuania together with his mother, Judge Fenskiene and applied for asylum in the United States. Lithuania is not seeking his extradition. He's currently attending college in the United States. We'll first recognize you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Congressman Smith. Holgren, sorry. Uh, my mom, Naringa Vinkiene, is a former judge and a parliament member of Lithuania. She's currently detained in Chicago's federal prison by the request of the Lithuanian government. She faces nearly 40 charges in her home country. The case started in 2008 when my cousin, who was four years old at the time, testified that while visiting her biological mother, she has been abused by three men who are associates of her mother. She identified the men as Andrus Usas, a businessman and advisor to the Speaker of Parliament, Judge Jonas Fermanavichus, and a third individual only known as Aedas. My uncle, the girl's father, spent nearly a year trying to bring the case to court. He sent out more than 200 requests asking for an investigation to his daughter's claims about her sexual exploitation. He spoke to national media and pleaded from, for help from local politicians. And although the court order psychiatrists and psychologists determined the girl's testimony as true and not a result of fantasy or fabrication, the case seemed to be going nowhere. Uh, could you play the first video, please? Kaip jinai tenai atvažiuodavo? Aš pasakysiu. Nu, davai pasakau, kokia aš turėsiu. Kaip būdavo, mes atvažiavom tą mundą, atėdavom į vidurą, ir būdavom... Kur buvom, Dimitėlė, kur buvom nuvažiavę dabar, kur žiūrėjom tenai, jo? Ir tam mes atėjom. Tenai, kas? Mes tam atėjom. Tenai, kas tu? Sėrinkė nuo gasų lemanukai, jis ir sudrusė tai. Mama? Jo. O kas ant fotografuodavo? Andras. O jinai nuoga būdavo? Jo. Nu, su Lėmenu, kur su trusikais? Jo. O tu būdavo ir matydavo į viską? Ir būdavo, kad dar jau žinai, būdavo, kad jie dar namėse ją atvalkėdavo. Mama? Jo. Irgi nuoga? O tu 
O, kaip tą mamą ten vieš būti fotkindavo. Ant rusų esas tik tai vienas būdavo? Ar būdavo ir tie kiti? Nu, kiti būdavo. Ir kaip jų vardai? Jonas, Andrius ir Raidas. Kaip atrodo ūsia dabar? Išvaizė. In October of 2009, the accused judge and another woman involved in the abuse were shot and killed. My cousin's father disappeared that same day. My uncle became the prime, su prime suspect, and right away, the prosecutors announced on national media that there was DNA evidence on the murder weapon confirming that my uncle committed the crime. Only much later, the prosecutors had to admit that they had made a mistake and no DNA was found. A few months later, my uncle was also found dead. His death was determined to be an accident, a finding that many Lithuanians had trouble believing. After my uncle's disappearance in October of 2009, government officials seized my cousin from the kindergarten and placed her in a psychiatric hospital. My mom was given custody of my cousin and they were finally able to come home. The case was finally started and the Lithuanian parliament concluded that the prosecutors stole the case and neglected to investigate my cousin's claims. Many of the officials involved lost their jobs, including the prosecutor general. My mom, who was a judge at the time, started to publicly speak about the bribery and corruption in the Lithuanian courts. Journalists that supported my mom were often fined or their shows even prohibited to air. In May of 2010, the court announced that my cousin has to live with her biological mother, despite the fact that the pedophilia case has not been concluded yet and the fact that the girl was testifying against her mother for facilitating the molestation. My cousin refused to go and thousands of Lithuanians surrounded the house and would not let the police pass and seize her. In June of that year, the alleged pedophile Usus was also found dead. According to the government, he also died of natural causes. He was found laying in a few inch uh, deep puddle of water near his four wheeler with his helmet near him. My cousin developed PTSD from the attempts to return her to her mother and her doctors issued an order against further traumatizing attempts. Despite that fact, on May 17, 2012, around 240 police officers came to our house and used force against my cousin, violated my mother's judicial immunity by injuring her and carried my cousin away screaming. Please play the second video.
I haven't seen my cousin ever since. After that day, there were massive protests and demonstrations in Lithuania and abroad. My mother resigned from the bench and founded a new political party created to fight, fight against corruption and pedophilia, which won seven seats in the parliament while having almost zero funding. She promised to reform the judicial and political systems in Lithuania with stricter punishments for corruption, rape, and pedophilia. Soon after the election, the prosecutor general requested the parliament to remove to remove my mother's legal immunity. The liberals, the conservatives, and the socialists all announced that they will be invo voting in favor of removing my mother's legal immunity even before any evidence was presented and even before the ruling of the parliamentary commission that was supposed to investigate the matter. It became clear that my mother was an inconvenient obstacle to the corrupt legal and political systems, and it was not safe for her in Lithuania anymore. So in 2013, my mother and I fled to the United States and asked for political asylum. But the Lithuanian government is seeking my mom's extradition before her political asylum case takes place. And the current extradition treaty does not allow my mom to present any counter evidence to the Lithuanian government's claims or to demonstrate the political nature of the case. The, num the number of crimes that my mom is accused of grew to 39. My grandparents, my aunts and uncles, our neighbors, my mom's supporters, and many of her party members are all facing charges in Lithuania, and some of them have already been sentenced. My mother will never receive a fair trial in Lithuania because Gintaras Kirjevičius, the chairman of the Supreme Court of Lithuania, has called my mom an abscess in the judicial and the political systems and the trouble of the whole state. And the journalists, the prosecutors, and the politicians have been developing that narrative for years now. How can she receive a fair trial in Lithuania when the highest court officials are making public statements like this? There have been multiple uninvestigated deaths associated with the pedophilia case in Lithuania, and my mom and her family have also received multiple threats, and during one of my mom's campaign rallies, her car was tampered with. The government of Lithuania is biased towards my mother and is neither capable of guaranteeing a fair trial for her, nor can it guarantee her safety there. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Karelis, for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Next, I will introduce uh, Professor Mary G. Leary. Professor Leary is a professor of law at the Catholic University of America. Professor Leary's scholarship examines the intersection of criminal law, constitutional criminal procedure, technology, and contemporary victimization. She focuses on the exploitation and abuse of women, children, and vulnerable peoples. She's recognized as an expert in, the areas of, uh, in these areas of criminal law, victimization, exploitation, human trafficking, missing persons, technology, and the Fourth Amendment. Professor Leary. Thank you very much, Representative Holgren. Uh, and thank you for convening this hearing. I'm grateful for the opportunity to engage in a dialogue with you regarding the subject of this hearing, which touches on an area of my scholarship, child sexual exploitation. I want to begin my comments by noting that I participate in this dialogue without a side in this debate, but as a legal researcher in the field of child sexual exploitation, I hope to assist the commission in putting some of this uh, case into a context and offer some reference points in the field of child sex trafficking. Since the year 2000, the United States has been a leader in the international community in developing laws and policy regarding human trafficking. With the congressional passing of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000 and its subsequent reauthorizations in 2003, 2005, 2008, 2013, and 2015, Congress properly cast a comprehensive definition of human trafficking generally and sex trafficking specifically. In so doing, Congress ensured that these definitions would reflect our ongoing and improved understanding of the realities of human trafficking by encompassing trafficking in all its forms. Similarly, these definitions seek to capture the many different types of traffickers that victims encounter and correctly label them as human traffickers. I don't need to tell the commission, but for the record, the TVPA defines sex trafficking to include the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. Crucial to our discussion today, however, is the legal definition of commercial sex act. A commercial sex act is not only a situation in which a purchaser buys a human being in cash from a third party trafficker, Colloquially, colloquially referred to as a pimp here in the United States. Uh, 
but rather the definition of commercial sex act, Congress, Congress sought to encompass the many forms of sex trafficking that occur, including what has been referred to as interfamilial sex trafficking. A commercial sex act includes any sex act on the account of which, quote, anything of value is given or received by any person. Therefore, the laws recognized from early on the commercial nature necessary for an act of sexual exploitation to be a sex trafficking simply requires that exchange of anything of value between any two, t any two people. Congress further demonstrated this comprehensive approach to sex trafficking of minors by including in its criminal offense uh, uh, explicitly an offender who, quote, knowingly benefits financially or by receiving anything of value by participating in a sex trafficking venture, as long as they know the person is a minor who will be engaged in the Commercial Sex Act. This provision captures the criminality of a parent who engages in an interfamilial child sex trafficking uh, occurrence. Thus, the American law has recognized the prevalence of interfamilial sex trafficking and seeks to specifically combat it. Of course, the United States is not alone. Most other nations have joined the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in person, persons, especially women and children. That protocol, also known as the Palermo Protocol, defines trafficking equally as broadly, and I want to focus on the specific language where it defines trafficking to include the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. So again, not only does the Palermo Protocol explicitly identify this kind of exchange, um, it also describes exploitation at a minimum, the exploitation of prostitution or other forms of sexual exploitation. Therefore, under American law, um, when any person receives a benefit or something of value in exchange for providing an another for a sex act, that is sex trafficking, and internationally, we have the same situation. The case before the commission today, assertions have been made that the child, in this case, was not only sexually abused, but that the child's mother was, quote, complicit in allowing the abuse. In the course of the commission's review of this case, should it encounter evidence of this compliance being in, including an exchange of something of value, or that the victim's mother received a benefit for her consent to sexually abuse her daughter, such information would suggest a case involving child sex trafficking. Arguably, that could transform this case into one in which a guardian, in this case the judge, simply did not want to hand her ward over to a sex trafficker. As the commission considers this case um, in, the que in the context of extradition and asylum, it may also wish to consider the possible implications of child sex trafficking should it encounter this evidence of the exchange. While child sexual abuse in all its forms is an assault on the dignity of a child, the matter of child sex trafficking is one of import not only to the United States but globally. Given the leadership of the United States in combating trafficking in person and Congress's specific role in crafting a comprehensive trafficking legislation and ratifying the Palermo Protocol, instances of child sex trafficking have great import in American policy. If evidence of a benefit-based uh, benefit compliance emerges in the Commission's review of this case, that evidence should be closely examined. And therefore, as the Commission considers this complex case, it should examine it through the lens of child sex trafficking and should the investigation indicate a commercial sex act. I thank you for the time and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Professor Leary. Next we'll introduce uh, Abby Jolis. Uh, Abby Jolis is a Washington DC based international human rights litigator. She provides representation worldwide, including conflict zones. She handles individual, corporate, criminal, and civil matters involving unlawful property confiscation, incarceration of risk of incarceration, and other human rights violations, including immigration and global migration. Abby was the first American woman admitted to the International Criminal Court and the first American admitted to the African Court on Human and People's Rights. She achieved a landmark result at the International Crim Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, Ms. Jolis, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very much, uh, Representative Holtgren, uh, for the invitation to speak to you today about the extradition of Judge Naringa 
Vensky, Vensky, I won't make that mistake again. My name is Abby Jollis. I am an international human rights uh, litigator working globally. Uh, I was the first American admitted to the International Criminal Court, and I achieved a landmark decision at the United Nations Rwanda Tribunal. I am a founding member of Hear Their Cries, working to end immunity for sexual assaults committed by staff members of international organizations, including the United Nations. I have tried cases for more than 30 years, and I have handled hundreds of assault cases, both felonies and misdemeanors. I am going to focus on three areas. First, what constitutes an extraditable offense under Article II of the Extradition Treaty between the United States and Lithuania? Second, the Extradition Treaty's Article 16 a limit on addition of new charges uh, should Judge uh, Vinskiani be returned. This is a technical but uh, an unenforceable uh, limit. And finally, uh, and very important, the proviso that extradition must be refused when the charges are politically motivated under uh, Article 4. It must be refused. It's not uh, uh, discretionary. In 2015, Lithuania demanded extradition of Judge Venskiani based on an alleged May 2012 assault on a federal officer. Judge Venskiani fled to the United States in April of 2013 and immediately filed a request for political asylum, which is still pending. Between May, the May 2012 alleged assault and her April 2013 flight to the United States, Judge Venskiani was not arrested. At the time of the extradition demand, <clears throat> By Lithuania, Judge Venskiani had been in the United States for two and a half years. On May 17, 2012, as uh, you've heard from Corollas, 240 federal officers stormed Judge Venskiani's home to remove her seven year old niece. It is alleged that Judge Venskiani and the little girl resisted, and that Judge Venskiani punched a federal officer at that time. In the United States, when a federal officer is feloniously assaulted, the perpetrator is arrested immediately and jailed without bond. Here, it strains credulity to believe that there was a serious assault when the perpetrator remained free for an entire year and then was able to flee the country. Moreover, no extradition request was made for two and a half years after Judge Venskiani's arrival in the United States. In the United States, these types of assault charges are often disposed of by way of plea bargains. Fair Trial International reports that there is no plea bargaining process in Lithuania. This further taints the process and presents a clear and present danger to Judge Venskiani should she be returned to Lithuania. The legal filings in this matter indicate that many charges have been added and subtracted over six years. At this juncture, there is one so-called extraditable charge and three related charges which wouldn't be extraditable on their own. Technically, uh, pursuant to Article 16, Lithuania is not permitted to add charges once Judge Venskiani returns. Practically, this is unenforceable. This is a matter of concern here because Lithuania's original extradition request contained 14 charges, 10 of which uh, were not extraditable offenses. In addition, during the last six years, 39 different charges were alleged and added and subtracted, and most of those charges can't be the basis of extradition. There is much evidence that the extradition demand for Judge Venskiani is politically motivated. When charges are politically motivated, the Secretary, excuse me, the Secretary of State must refuse extradition. An army of 240 federal officers converging on a private home to take custody of one little girl is a powerful indicator of political motivation. There are many other indications of political motivation, including the nature of all but one of the 39 charges 
uh, discussed over the past six years. Charges such as contempt for the memory of the deceased, unauthorized disclosure about a person's private life, abuse of the rights and duties of parents, and complicity in a criminal act, unspecified, are a few of the manufactured, vague, politically motivated charges. Press reports indicate that sending Judge Vinskiany back to Lithuania is a likely death sentence and that there is no chance of a fair trial. It is notable that Judge Vinskiany's political party, The Way of Courage, uh, seeks reforms, as uh, Corrales uh, indicated, in the justice system. But one of the things that they're looking to do is implement jury trials. It is also notable that in 2017, the State Department issued a report indicating that Lithuanian prisons do not meet international standards. Also in 2017, Malta rejected an extradition request uh, from Lithuania on this basis. Ireland has refused to extradite to Lithuania based on substandard Lithuanian prison conditions as well. The Irish court ruled that the accused was likely to be held in inhuman and degrading conditions if extradited. Denmark has refused extradition to Lithuania, finding there was a risk the accused would be tortured if returned to face charges. In conclusion, it is likely that Judge Venskiany will suffer irreparable harm if she is returned to Lithuania. I am here today in the hopes that I can help convince you to do everything in your power to keep Judge Venskiany in the United States so that her 2013 asylum application, which has an excellent chance of success, can be decided. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. I appreciate your testimony. Our final witness is Dr. Vitotas Matulavichus. Uh, Dr. Matulavichus was elected to Lithuanian Parliament along with Jun Judge Vinsky, Vinsky, excuse me, as a candidate of the new Way of Courage Party, which was led again by Judge Vinskine. He served for four years, but did not run again after Judge Vinskiene asked for political asylum in the United States. Dr. Matulavichus uh, has a PhD in humanitarian studies and is a journalist by trade. For many years, he had his own television sh show called The Coast, which was one of the top television, sh television shows in Lithuania. For his professional work, he was awarded twice as a person of the year and best journalist in popular, popular Lithuanian awards called a Who is Who in Lithuania. Doctor, thank you for being here today. Can, can you make sure your microphones are on? Sorry. I, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Haldgren and all the members of the Helsinki Commission. It would be much more pleasant to discuss other topics in this environment. Turbūt kiekvienos šalies istorija yra tokio bylų, kurios kaip veidrodė atspindi visas valstybės problemas, kaip pavyzdžiui, klasika tapos I believe that in the history of any country there are cases that reflect, mirror the um, key essential problems of the country. The mirror of that kind became the uh, case of uh, Judge Venskiene and the judiciary persecution of uh, the judge. Dar visai nesinei ši moteris buvo viena populiariausių Lietuvos politikių. Until recently she was one of the most popular Lithuanian politicians. Parlamentinės partijos lyderė. The leader of the parliamentary party. Kovos prieš teismų korupciją simbolis ir gal net būsima Lietuvos prezidentė. She became a symbol of the fight against the court corruption and probably the future Lithuanian president. But as we know, this year we have the Chicago Scalier, which will be able to deport the Lietuvą, 
ir sugrįžus dešimties skaltinimu ir nenuspėjama ateitis. However, she is today a prisoner in Chicago and she can be deported to Lithuania where dozens of accusations and uncertain future are awaiting her. Tai kas gi nutiko, kad moteris, tokia sėkminga moteris, kuri be viso kito 13 metų neprikaištingai dirbo teisėjas, tai gal tapo tarptautiniu mastu ieškama nusikaltelė. What happened that such a respectable and successful woman who worked as a judge for 13 years suddenly became an internationally sought for criminal? Nutiko tai, ko aš nepalinkėčiau niekam iš čia susirinkusijų. What really happened is something that I wouldn't wish on my enemy. Vieną nelemtą dieną jos brolio dukrelė pradėjo pasakot ir rodyti vaizdžiai, kaip ją, jos kūną išnaudoja, vaikišką kūną išnaudoja, motinos draugas ir dar du vyriškiai. One day her brother's daughter began to tell and visually demonstrate how her mother's friend and two more men were using her body. Ir suprantama, kad visą laiką buvusi teisingumo pusėje kaip teisėja, Neringa Vienskienė pradėjo ginti savo dukteriečią. And it's only understandable that Neringa Vienskienė, being a judge, started defending her niece. Kokio masto tai buvo kova, galima spręsti iš tokio fakto. The scale of such a fight can be judged from the fact. Per kelerius metus Neringa su broliu parašė daugiai nei du šimtus skundų teisės saugos ir kitas valstybės institucijas. That in several years Neringa Vienskienė and her brother wrote over 200 complaints and statements to law enforcement and other state authorities. Tačiau ne vienas pedofilas taip ir neatsidūrė teisėmųjų suole. Unfortunately, none of the alleged pedophiles ended up on a defendant's bench. Viena iš tų trijų vyriškių, kuri mergai teiminėjo, beje dirbant į teisėjų, kažkas nušovė. One of the three men who worked as a judge was shot by someone. Kitas nebuvo identifikuotas. The other was not identified. O trečiasis, kuriam vienintelėm buvo pateikti kaltinimai mergaitės tvirkinimu, nukrito nuo keturačio motociklo ir paskendo lygiai kelių siekančioje baloje. The third one, who was the only one against whom the charges of molestation were brought up, in the eve of the court hearing, fell from a four-wheel motorcycle and drowned in a knee-high puddle of water. Beje, jis buvo Lietuvos parlamento pirmininko padėjęs. Unfortunately, he was the assistant to the speaker of Lithuanian parliament. Negyvas buvo rastas ir mergaitės tėvas. The girl's father was found dead as well. Kadangi jis nusivylė teisės saugos neveiklumu, nufilmavo mes matėme fragmentus mergaitės parodymus ir pradėjo dalinti diskelius žurnalistams. O tai buvo be galo pavojinga. Out of frustration, he, due to the inaction of law enforcement, videotaped his daughter's testimony and began distributing it to journalists. And it was extremely dangerous. Kai pagrindinės proceso šalys buvo įžudytos, ar mirė į tartinomis aplinkybėmis, teismas sugrįžo prie žuvusio kaltinamo bylos ir jį išteisino po mirties. When the main parties to the proceedings were murdered or died in suspicious circumstances, the court tried to the deceased defendant according to the court Teisėjo nuomonė, jokios pedofilijos nebuvo. There was no pedofilija. Ir kad kaltinimai buvo tyčiai įsigalvoti mergaitės tėvo, nes jis neva norėjo pakengti savo buvusiai žmonai. Since the allegations supposedly were deliberately made up by the girl's father, who wanted to harm his ex-wife. Tokia trumpa šios bylos fabula. This is a short plot of the case. Mano įsitikinimu jį parodo, kas gali nutikti žmonėms, kurie ryštas į susigrumtį su įtakai bei ryšiais garsėjančiais pedofilais. In my conviction, that exhibits what can happen to people who are determined to fight against influential pedophiles who have important connections. Nors šiau beveik buvo lėsta ta tema, norėčiau atkreipti jūsų dėmesį, kad pedofilijos bylos labai sunkiai skinas į kelią ir senosiose demokratijose, turinčias ilgas teisinės tradicijas. I would like also to mention that the cases of pedofilia have tough time in other western countries that have old democratic traditions. Kaip pavyzdį, galėčiau paminėti Didžiosios Britanijos atveju, kur vaikus daugelį dešimtmečių seksualiai išnaudojo garsi televizijos žvaigždė ir kitie užti asmenys. As an example, I can give the cases in Britain, where a movie star was taking advantage and abusing children. 
Bet ne tokioj nuostabioj šaly jų nusikaltimai buvo pradėti tirti tik pastaraisiais metais, kai daugelis iš šitų galimų įtarimų jų stoja jau prieš Dievo teismą. Unfortunately, all of that came to the surface only after many, many years later, many, many years later, when many of those powerful have been facing the judgment on the other side of life. Pažinašį padėtis Belgijoje, kur irgi garsios pedofilijos bylos tyrimas susidūrė su milžiškom kliūtimis. A similar situation occurred in Belgium, where the investigation of the famous pedophile case also encountered obstacles that have not yet been seen. Ir kai teisingumas paėdėjo iš mirties taško tik tada, kai protestuodami prieš teisės saugą į gatvės išėjo šimtai tūkstančių Belgijos piliečių ir kai įsikišo net šalies parlamentas. The justice system started moving from the point of death of only when hundreds of thousands of citizens came to the streets, protesting the inactivity of the law enforcement and the country's parliament decided finally to step in. Lietuvoje padėtis dar sudėtingesnė, kad argi jį gi šiol neatsikratė komunistinio laiko tarpio įdų ir korupsinių paparučių. In Lietuvoje the situation is even more grave, since until now we didn't eliminate and refuse the flaws and corrupt practices of the communist period of our lives. O ir pačią vienskienės bylą galima laikyti tipišku sovietinės teisinės sistemos recidivų. And the case of... Vinskenė itself can be regarded as a typical recurrence of the Soviet legal system. Kai įtakingų asmenų nusikaltimus, per daug atkakliai kalbantis žmogus, pats paverčiamas nusikaltiliu. When an individual addressing the crimes of the powerful is being labeled as a criminal himself. Būtent taip elgdavosi KGB, kai disidentų ar kitų teisybės iškuotų viešumą keliami faktai pradėjo tapdavo per daug pavojingi sistemai. That's how the KGB treated the dissidents and the people who would address the crimes and brought danger to the system and comfort levels. Ir tai nėra vien mano nuomonė. And it's not only my opinion. Viena iš buvusių kovotojų su sovietidių režimu Nijolė Sadunaitė. One of the former anti-Soviet fighters, a nun, A Catholic nun, sister Nijolė Sadunaitė. Nijolė Sadunaitė apie vienskienės bylą taip ir pasakė, tai tas pats KGB braižas, citata. I commented on the case of Judge Vienskienė, this is the same KGB pattern. Tarp kitko gal bus įdomu sužinoti, kad mano paminėta disidentė Sadunaitė yra Teksasų miesto garbės pilietė. Maybe it's interesting for you to hear that the nun Nijolė Sadunaitė is an honorary citizen of a city in Texas. Ji taip pat apdovanota Kalifornijos Respublikono partijos medalių už ilgametę kovą už žmogaus teises. She also has been awarded by the Republican Party of California a medal for her long fight for the human rights. Taigi, tai yra moteris, kuris žino, ką sako. That's a lady who knows what she's saying. Yra, yra viena, ir ji, Nijolė Sadunit, yra viena iš aktyviausių neringos vienskienės teisės gynėje. And Sister Sadunaiti is one of the most active and persistent defenders of the rights of Vinskienė. Aš suprantu, kad Chicago's teismo teisėja, kuri nagradėjo Vinskienės ekstradicijos bylą, negalėjo žinoti visos po komunistijų šalių specifikos. I do understand that the Chicago judge who examined the extradition case of Judge Vinskienė could not know the specifics of all post-communist countries. Ir todėl nusprendė, kad pabėgėlė turės visas galimybės apginti savo teises Lietuvos teisme. And therefore she decided that the refugee would have every opportunity to defend her rights in the Lithuanian court. Tačiau tiems, kurie šią specifiką žino, teisėjos argumentas dėja sukėlė tik karšią šypsena. However, for those of us who know the beast, the judgment, judge's argument has only caused a bitter smile. Aš čia išvardinsiu bent tris pagrindinius tarptautinės teisės normų pažeidimus, su kuriais svenskieniai tektų susidurti, jei būtų deportuota į Lietuvą. I will touch upon three of the main violations of the standards of international law that Judge Vienskienė would need to face if she would be deported to Lithuania. Visų pirma, kiltų neišvengiamas pavojus jos gyvybėj. First of all, there would be an imminent danger to her life. 
Aš jau minėjau, kad pedofilijos byla jau nusinešė mažiausiai šešių žmonių gyvybės. I will already claim that the pedofilia case in this question uh, took six, uh, lives of six people. Įskaitant tuos, kurie buvo nužudyti ar mirė įtarimus keliančiomis aplinkybėmis. Including those who were killed or died under suspicious circumstances. Vienas iš prokuratūros vadovų net visiškai viešai pavadino šią bylą bylą žudike. One of the leaders of the prosecutor's office even labeled uh, the case as the case of a killer. Bet valstybės apsauga buvo skirta ne nuo pedofilų nukentėjusiai pusėjai, o seksualiai išnaudotos mergaitės motinai. But the protection of the state was uh, appointed not to the victims who suffered for the actions of pedophiles, but to the mother of the sexually exploited girl who was supposed to be indicted. Tai pačiai motinai, kuri teismų, kuriai teismų sprendimu turėjo būti pareišti įtarimai bent ir inkavinkų. She was supposed to be indicted as an accomplice in this case based on a court order. Aš kalbu apie priimtą teismų sprendimą, kurio prokurorai net neįvykdė, teisiniai valstybė. Uh, the, the, the decision of the court has never been implemented. Todėl išlieka didelė tikimybė, kad ir šią kart, šį kartą niekas deramai nepasirūpis viensienės saugumu ir jei kas nors atsitiks kameroje. Therefore, there is a high probability that no appropriate attention will be given to viensienės safety at this time and anything could happen to her in the prison cell. Kaip neretai atsitinka Lietuvos įkalinimo įstaigose. As often happens in Lithuanian prisons. O siūsti žmogų įmirti, galbūt išskyrus karo atvejus, draudžia ne tik tarptautinės teisės normos, bet ir elementarų žmogiškumas. And sending a person to die, unless excluding the war cases, probably prohibits not only the rules, is prohibited not only by the rules of international laws, but uh, it's also elementary humanitarian principle. Antra pagal visuotinę žmogaus teisių deklaraciją, kiekvienas asmuo turi teisę į teisingą ir nešališką teismą, dešimtas straipsis deklaracijos. Article 10 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights claims that every person has the right to a fair and impartial trial. Jei vienskienį būtų sugražinta į Lietuvą, jos byla anksčiau ir vėliau nagrinėtų tas pats aukščiausio teismo pirmininkas, Gintaras Kryževičius, kuris, kaip jau kalbėjo Karolis, yra viešai pavadinęs Svenskienė teisinį sistemos pūlinių. If uh, Judge Svenskienė would be returned to Lithuania, her case most probably would be considered by the Supreme Court, whose chairman Kryževičius publicly named her an abscess in the judicial system. Tai yra be galo žeminant į žodžiai. It's a very humiliating labeling. Ir jis, teismo pirininkas, šiais savo žovėdžiais davė suprasti, kad vienskienės atžiūrėjų gali būti priimtas tik apkeltinamasis verdiktas. And basically what he is saying, that if she is back, the only verdict she can expect is guilty. Ir tai buvo apribuota vienskienės teisį į teisingą nešališką teismą. And that's how he restricted her right to a fair and impartial trial. Ir nors šiuo metu, mano paminėtas Kryževičius, jau užima kitas pareigas, Although uh, Judge Kryževičius is uh, now in a different position within the court system. Jis ir toliau išlieka labai įtakingo teismų pareigūnų, nes vadovauja Lietuvos admis, vyriausiam administracijam teismui. He is still in a very influential judicial position, the head of the Supreme Administrative Court of Lithuania. Ir trečias paskutinis punktas. And the last uh, item, three. Aukščiausio teismo pirmininkas tą sykį žengė ir dar toliau ir pavadino vienskienę pūlinių ir politinėje sistemoje. Uh, the chairman of the Supreme Court proceeded even further by labeling Venskienė as an abscess in the political system as well. O tai jau beveik atviras raginimas politikams bendrom jėgom susiduroti su bendru priešu. And this was almost an open call and invitation for the politicians to deal with the common enemy. Kuris kritikuoja ne tik teisminę, bet ir politinę valdžią. Who constantly criticized both the judicial and the political authorities. Tai ir įvyko, kai Vienskienė buvo išrinkta į Lietuvos Respublikos Seimą, kitaip sakant, parlamentą. That's what happened when Mrs. Vienskienė was elected into the parliament of the Republic of Lithuania. Kai ji, nuogastaudama dėl savo saugumo pasitraukė jungtinės valstijas. When Vienskienė, fearing for her own safety, uh, left for the United States. Seimas jai surengė apkaltą už posėdžių nelankyvą 
ir pašalino iš parlamento narių. The parliament impeached her for not attending the meeting and expelled her from the parliament. Tai buvo padaryta ją jų žakių kaip kokie karo nusikaltiliai. This was done behind her back. Nesuteikiant jokios galimybės pasiteisinti. Without providing an opportunity to defend herself. Ir kas baisiausia, pažeidžiant parlamento statutą, kuris turi įstatymo galę. And what's even worse, in the violation with the statute of this parliament, which has the power of law. Tokiais pačiais principais esu tikras būtų vadovaujomisi ir tada, jei vienskienė būtų gražinta į Lietuvą. I have no doubt that the same principles would be adhered if vienskienė would be returned to Lithuania. Nes jos likimas prestų tie patys susimokė teisėje ir politikai. Because her fate would be again in the hands of the same conspired politicians and judges. Labai ačiū Jums už dėmesį, kad išklausit ir su malonumai atsakysiu klausimus, jeigu jų bus. Thank you for your attention and for hearing me out, and I'm here to answer the questions if you have any. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, each of you. Also, so glad to be joined uh, by my friend and colleague from Texas, uh, also Helsinki Commission member, uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Thank you so much for being with us. I just have a few questions, if that's all right, and then I do apologize uh, with um, uh, many things going on today. Uh, We'll have to finish up after a few questions, but Carolus, if I could ask you first, if you could just briefly talk about what's happened to your family and other supporters of your family who've remained in Lithuania. Thank you, Congressman. Um, as we talked about it, my mom is facing dozens of charges. My grandparents have been trialed multiple times. My mom's uh, family members, her aunts, her uncles, uh, her cousins, all of them are facing charges. Basically, everyone we know is facing charges in Lithuania, and um, and there is a enormous pressure uh, on each of those uh, persons. Ms. Uh, Jolas, if I could address to you, uh, in your testimony, you indicate that the Way of Courage Party is advocating for jury trials, or at least had been, uh, in Lithuania. Do I understand correctly that Lithuania does not currently have jury trials, and, and how could this affect uh, Judge Vinskiniere uh, if she is extradited? Well, if, pardon me, thank you for that question. Uh, Judge, if Judge Vinskiniere is extradited, I think they're just going to have a very quick kind of a system. They don't have jury trials, and uh, almost more uh, important, uh, they don't have plea bargains. So they, uh, they have something called a penal order, and that's just as best I can tell uh, where you, you plead guilty. You just plead guilty, and you admit it, and then you go to jail, or you suffer whatever consequences. Uh, so. Uh, the way I see it from everything that I've, that I've read, if she goes back, it's going to be a very uh, quick, uh, quick, quickly disposed of. But it is shocking to me that she committed the crime, allegedly, in 2012. She sat there. Well, I, I mean, I understand she ran for office. She did all these things. And I also understand that she uh, allegedly had immunity. But that doesn't really matter because, you know, if, if you do something for which you have immunity, they arrest you and they take your defenses when you get, you know, when you get there. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. I had immunity so, or so is it during that. So the fact that they just let it go and then suddenly in 2015, after she had been here two and a half years, they decided that that was such a serious extra crime. Since when do we go extraditing people for these old cases where they didn't really do anything. I mean, and, and never would you see that in the United States. If, 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 a, if, a, if you get in the way of a federal officer who's trying to effect an arrest or a, or a custody uh, situation, and you, and you clock them, which she's alleged to have done, punch them, you're, you're done. They arrest you immediately. They don't, they don't say, oh, you know, go, go about your business, and then, oh, flee to another country. Anyway, hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, thank you. Professor Leary, um, more specifically uh, on situations like this, if a child is testifying against a parent in a trafficking case, would a court ordinarily order that the child be returned to the parent before the testimony was complete? 
Thank you for your question, Representative. Of course not. That would compromise the child witness. Um, we would say she would have conflicting allegiances, and typically the child would be at a minimum with a caregiving relative, as she was in this case, or if there was none available, some uh, sort of foster care system. It is highly unusual with a pending investigation to have a child victim go live with the um, alleged perpetrator. Thanks, Professor. Dr. Matulavichus, uh, if I could address a question to you. wonder how uh, Judge Vinskiene's exit from Lithuania has affected the Way of Courage party. It affected it destructively. Well, all of us knew that it will not end well, and there was no way for us to uh, keep her at home. And once she left for the United States, visus apie gana didelis nusivilimas jūsų suomenė. The, the, the whole of society, there was such a big disappointment for everyone. Kadangi prasidėjo baisus teismų procesai, kuriuose buvo persiūnimas kiekvienas ją palaikęs. Because any person that ever supported the party or supported Venskienė has been... Dešimtį žmonių buvo teisėmi. Tens and tens of people went to courts. Kadangi parodė savo pilietinę pareigą. Because they, they uh, show the citizen's duty to the country. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Carolis, if I can address it to you, because I think this is, uh, it's been addressed by uh, really all the witnesses, but uh, just very specifically, um, the government of Lithuania did not uh, seek extradition until 2015. They say that it was because they did not know uh, where Judge Vinskiene was living. Uh, was your mother hiding? Uh, what was she doing in the U.S. during that time? Thank you for the question. Um, the first charges were brought against my mom, including the assault on the officer um, in 2012, while she was still a judge. Her legal immunity was removed for the first time, and she did not have any legal protections. Um, then later she was elected to the parliament where she gained those protections once again. But the Lithuanian law allows uh, the person, if they're caught in the middle of committing the act, even uh, the criminal act, even if they're, uh, even if they have legal immunity, they can be arrested on the spot. Thank you. Yes, doctor. The same words. Uh, as a member of parliament, I personally was asking the majority of the Thank you again. Thank you. I've got so many more questions, and this is so upsetting and hard to understand and disappointing. Uh, and uh, I just again want to thank all of you for your time, for being here. Uh, I'm sorry it's such a busy day uh, in Washington. I wish all of my colleagues could be here, but that's part of our job uh, is to be able to get information and then share it. And so I will do my best uh, to let my other colleagues know. Uh, to be able to, uh, for them even to see these uh, really difficult to see uh, videos uh, that you've shown us, just horrible 
Uh, and uh, again, just uh, want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your courage uh, for being involved in this. Uh, and I think this is so important for us to know about this and continue to do everything we can to uh, protect the judge, uh, but then also uh, hope to find answers uh, uh, for this little girl, uh, this precious little girl, and to find out uh, how she's doing and to make sure that she is uh, uh, placed somewhere where she knows she can be safe finally. So again, thank you all. Uh, if there is other information that you have that you want to get to us, please let us know at the Helsinki Commission. We'll make sure all the members of the commission have it, but also we'll make sure we get it out to uh, other colleagues here in Congress. With that, again, thank you, and we will adjourn this uh, commission hearing.